feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But it's a- hey everyone, I am Mark Scribner, your host of The Shrimp Tank with my co-host John Warner from, from um, Link Ventures today. Today we have an amazing guest, John Linehan. We're going to bring him on in just a minute. I would like to remind all the listeners that The Shrimp Tank can be followed basically anywhere that you get your podcast. We are nationally syndicated through iHeart, Google, Stitch, Apple, SoundCloud, basically everywhere that you consume your podcast, you can find us there. Uh, we would love to get your followership. If you just hit that subscription button and the like button, that will alert you to uh, future shows. There are about 13 cities across the country, as well as syndicated in Canada right now. So there's great content. The tagline of the show is where book smarts and street smarts collide. Uh, we don't ever say that you shouldn't get an MBA from your places like Harvard or MIT. Um, but when you get to talk to entrepreneurs and CEOs like people like John Linehan, you get to learn stuff that you can't learn in the classroom. So um, before we bring on John, I want to just have John Warner do an intro to John Linehan. There's two Johns today. And uh, also to, to tell a little bit about our sponsors today, which is Link Ventures. Great. Um, thanks, Mark. It's always a pleasure to do the show with you. So John Linehan is one of the crown jewels of the Boston region. Uh, I guess Frank, Frederick Law Olmsted created the Emerald Necklace, and, and part of the Emerald Necklace is Franklin Park, and the Franklin Zoo was there. Uh, it's not doesn't have the resources of the San Diego Zoo, uh, but it serves a really important purpose for the neighborhoods of Boston. A lot of maps of Boston show a square of the peninsula of downtown Boston, and they leave out uh, uh, many of uh, uh, the neighborhoods of, of some of the working class families uh, of the city. And the zoo has played uh, such an important role in the community. Uh, also, uh, parents bringing up kids in the suburbs come to the zoo. You drive on some of the major highways. It says where the zoo is, even though you're tens of miles away, because it, it's important. And uh, I'm really proud of the kind of leadership that John has showed there. Uh, he didn't come in as a hired uh, fundraiser to kind of do another capital campaign. He was a guy that that uh, came up through the ranks as like a zookeeper. I don't know if that's the latest term for it. And when he was there, little Joe escaped and ran into Roxbury. And uh, I think a bunch of uh, state troopers had uh, had guns on him. And uh, there's a gorilla and could have taken him out, uh, lost a life that day. And and uh, John Linehan uh, was able to help uh, little Joe kind of come back and make good choices and and is in the <laughs> zoo and, and thriving today. And, you know, that speaks volumes of how awesome this guy is. And uh, I spent many, many days walking with John, you know, hearing his vision, his dreams. He's doing all sorts of stuff on genetics uh, and biodiversity with Harvard, and he's bringing them to the zoo. And as we think about climate change and how our species is doing on this planet, I think zoos are not the last bastion of colonialism, as, as some might say, uh, but they, I think, could be a window in how we coexist on this planet and, and survive. And I'm really proud to, to call John a friend. And, and know that John's running our zoos. It's not just the Franklin Park Zoo, but the Stone Zoo. And these are a little more tired zoos than shiny object zoos that you might find uh, you know, funded by Silicon Valley elites, uh, but they play such an important role. And I'm glad uh, that you and I, uh, Mark, can, can kind of spotlight this today. And Link Ventures, we're always looking for great leaders. And and uh, John is, uh, you know, one of those 30 under 30 uh, future leaders. So keep it up, John. Although I think you've worked at the zoo for like 40 years, but you're under 30, I'm sure. So Mark, that was the longer uh, intro than I should have done. I love but, uh, it. I love it. You know, my- yeah, no. And yeah. I just want to point out that John Linehan is the CEO of New England Zoo, um, approximately 1,800 animals under his care at any given time. Huge uh, uh, emphasis on conservation, which John Warner alluded to, um, and at any given time, probably over 200, overseeing 200 employees that are full-time. And I recently was able to um, see their Boston Lights exhibition, which if you're watching this now, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's something that's been going on for a couple of years, but they had a, a more recent uh, community event where they opened it up to everyone. And, and just to see the children's faces and the smiling and just exposure to a global uh, experience that I don't think many people would ever get to see. So, um, well, first off, John, thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate having you here today. It's my pleasure, Mark. And and uh, uh, John, thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was very generous of you. And uh, yeah, sometimes I think I'm a glorified zookeeper with a necktie. Not wearing it today. <laughs> Wear many roles. Um, 
Um, John, excuse me. Um, John Warner mentioned something about the community. I was just curious. Um, I grew up in, in uh, Melrose in the Stone Zoo. How important is it to have uh, these facilities in communities? And like, what what what's the role in kind of the benefit by having them and and um, the exposure? Well, I think they are more important now than ever. And 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 as John started alluding to, how we live on this planet is based on how educated and how sensitized people are and ultimately helping them to make a difference in the future of the planet. And that's what we shoot for here. That's what we're working at all the time. It's central to our mission. And the animals provide a, in many ways an emotional link to the life on the planet that we share it with. And, and ultimately people understanding that if these animals don't survive, we don't survive. And so uh, ideally, we are uh, trying to work towards uh, creating a uh, the people of Massachusetts and beyond a level of sensitivity to make it a better world and one that we cohabitate with all these incredible creatures. Good, John. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, do you do you have a favorite animal, or are you not allowed to have favorites at the zoo? Well, I don't think I'm supposed to. I'm kind of like a parent, but I do have to tell you that little Joe, that gorilla you were referring to, is kind of my my favorite right now. He's he's been around. I've known him for a long time. These become like old friends to you. And and Joe and I uh, go way back. He came here from the Bronx Zoo and he was two years old. And that's one thing I should be clear about. We aren't taking animals out of the wild. Many people don't understand that. All of the animals in the zoo, with the exception of a few rescues who've been orphaned in the wild, are, are from multiple generation captive born. And as I say, Joe was born at the Bronx. He is an incredibly intelligent gorilla, handsome too, <laughs> and, and um, just a character. And uh, we go when back to When you along. come into the exhibit, is he, does he recognize you? Does, oh, yeah. Is it like a, like a dog seeing their... their uh... Uh, you know, owner come home. Or something, yeah, it's or not a like a dog. It's even a, a greater level of recognition. In fact, what I've learned over the years is I think, and, and that's one of the beauties of this position or this organization is you can continue learning all the time uh, because we don't know it all about animals. But what I've detected in gorillas more broadly is they have a higher facial recognition ability than people do. And I think it was very important to their survival, to their evolution, to be able to recognize friends and, and uh, competitors out there. And so, you know, with it's not just me, but all of my staff, when they show their face amongst a crowd, the gorillas can immediately pick them out. And sometimes will, depending upon their relationship, which varies based on if you're a guy or a girl and are you a competitor or are you a a love interest, um, how they respond, but they respond very, uh, very clearly to different people. And there's a lot going on in there. John, just a quick follow-up. You guys have had a few babies recently, some twins, the first uh, child born in captivity. Can, can you uh, maybe highlight some of that for those who may not uh, know about this? Haven't sure, seen we've, we've had some- How are they really, doing? Really, really exciting uh, births in the last couple of years. In particular, one that uh, that's a bit of a show stealer is a baby gorilla. His name is Pablo, and he. I was just w out there with him earlier today, and uh, he is absolutely stealing everybody's hearts while he teases his siblings. He's out there with two older sisters and his parents, and uh, sometimes with little Joe, but he is just an uh, incredible animal. He was born by C-section. And only about the fourth gorilla we know of that was ever born by C-section is his mother had placenta previa, you know, similar to many, many women. And um, we had an incredible team from Brigham and women of, uh, you know, uh, uh, doctors that came in here and performed that surgery and then neonatologists that helped the baby. And uh, we get great great support from the Boston medical community for a lot of things that we do in the, in the uh, medical arena. But, um, and it's not just human doctors, veterinarians and, and other specialists, but uh, between the gorilla, then we, we had the first ever twin tapirs, uh, Baird's tapirs. 
which is a Central American uh, animal that looks a little, people think they look like a giant anteater, but it's really more related to rhinos and, and horses and zebras. Um, but fascinating animals that are very endangered. We've got field conservation projects for both those species, gorillas and uh, tapirs. And then we, we recently had uh, three otter, otter pups born. Um, we had a pygmy hippo that was incredible. I've been waiting years for, for, to have this successful birth and, and we finally did it and he's still out there with his mom. Uh, but uh, lots of exciting births and, and um, lots more to come. You know, we had a giraffe not too long, about, well, that's about a year ago now. Um, so, and, and we think we have another in the oven, but don't tell anybody. Um, but very long gestation for them, 15 months. But uh, no, you know, the babies make a big difference in drawing people in and in maintaining sustainable populations because we, we produce them by what are called, we have species survival plans and we collaborate with other AZA accredited zoos across the, the continent. And we swap animals based on their genetics so that we maintain genetic diversity for many, many generations to come. And so each of these births is exciting, each is challenging, but um, with the great medical staff we have on staff, the veterinarians and, and uh, vet techs and, and the animal care staff, uh, we do an incredible job and you know it's nothing but continuous improvement. And each animal is, it gets a, a, a real, uh, they have a plan and uh, they are enriched every day with something new and different and people taking notes on how they respond to that. So it's a very stimulating environment. And as we continue to build new exhibits, uh, we, make, we build in that stimulation into the exhibits and make it a, re a really complex uh, home that they live in. Hmm. John, under your leadership of um, of the, the the various zoos, uh, the it's thrived. I mean, it's it's a completely different experience than say 10, 15 years ago. Um, but you are in the nonprofit space. I'm just curious, like, what are some of the challenges being a nonprofit, whether it be capital raise or uh, partnerships and things like that that you sure. have to encounter? Obviously, sure. you're managing lots of different, wearing lots of hats all the time. That's but, right. But, um, you know, we do have people in the nonprofit world and business owners, and I think there's some parallels there. But what are some of the challenges being running a nonprofit at the scale that you're running it at now? I think uh, part of the challenge and some of them are unique to a zoo or aquarium. We have we have a living collection that, you know, no matter what we have to care for, you can't cut expenses in a whole bunch of my operations because they're, they're either life threatening or, or can result in other disasters that are, are just not acceptable. So our ability to reduce expenses, you know, for example, during COVID when we were shut down, uh, we, our very limited ability to reduce expenses during those long periods where you lose your income. Uh, we are a public private partnership. So we do get support from the Commonwealth. You know, maybe a third of our budget is currently coming from the, the our operating budget is coming from the Commonwealth. But raising capital was, is a real challenge. And one that we've been getting better and better with as we build a larger and larger cadre of supporters. And having that those supporters makes all the difference in the world. And we have some incredible people. You know, I, I will consider that really one of the joys of what I do is I get to interact with these donors and supporters who are some incredible people, you know, who are very generously sharing their treasure with us uh, to create something that benefits our visitors, benefits our animals, and ultimately benefits the world. And so I'm really happy to say that our, our support base is growing and we just completed the new gorilla exhibit all with private support. And uh, so nine and a half million dollars to build that new gorilla exhibit that is wonderful for the animals, wonderful for the visitors, and really creates a, sem a sense of empathy with the animals that, that uh, we couldn't achieve before. And, you know, we, we really put our heart and soul. It was one of those dream exhibits where people literally come into the middle of it and they're surrounded by gorillas. And that's where I was today. Gorillas on this side, gorillas on that side, and gorillas on the roof. And 
Um, they can look down at you through peepholes, but but they're in a in a almost a superior position to our visitors. We purposely set the floor down lower so that the people are looking up at the gorillas and the gorillas are looking down at you to build that respect and and um, not have people literally looking down their nose at the gorillas, but having a new appreciation of them. So um, that capital piece is a, is a tough one sometimes. We're, we're doing another project right now that, uh, as you know, we're all experiencing incredible growth in costs for construction. And we designed a, a project that was originally gonna cost $18 million. And now it's well over 20, well over, it's more like 23. And, and raising that additional money takes time and in, and in fact, because we've got other projects in the future lined up behind that, we've got a very strategic approach to how we're growing the organization. Um, those th That climbing construction costs is a real frustration. That's one for me, and I, I'm sure it's shared by other nonprofits, and I'm sure, sure it's shared by for-profits. Um, so going back and doing value engineering and doing uh, programmatic and, and design re reductions to make it work our challenge is that sometimes rip your heart out because you're giving up something that you thought was really important, but uh, or raising more money. So that's one of our challenges. Well, I would say John Warner probably knows more billionaires than anyone I know. So you might want to cozy up to him a little bit better with that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had planned to do, uh, I turned 50 uh, in April uh, and I had planned to throw a party to everyone I knew uh, to come to the zoo. And uh, I was going to do it in the tropical rainforest and COVID happened in March. So the April party was scrapped. So uh, I, I do want to bring my network uh, of friends to the zoo. You know, that, that leads to my next question. John, you, you've done a great job being a steward of the zoo and empowering leaders around you. Um, as you think about the next chapter of your leadership, um, what what kind of talent would you like um, your team to develop into, or what do you what do you want your team to be leading around? Because you you can't do it all. You're a facilitator uh, as much as you are, uh, um, you know, the leader. And then my other question is, if you could double your attendance, who, where would those people come from? The neighborhood? Would it come from people who don't have kids to people a little bit further away, people outside of Boston? Uh, where, where do you want the, the new uh, first timers uh, to come from? Well, I, I'll start with your second question, John. Um, and I may need a reminder on the first one. Um, <laughs> but I want them to come from uh, particularly areas where they're out of touch with nature. So urban areas, because I think that's one of our biggest challenges. More and more people are, are in urban areas and have lost touch with nature and don't understand the value that it brings to us, uh, both personally and, and uh, socially, you know, societally, I should say. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's something that I work on both in and outside the zoo is, is preserving open space and um, wildlife habitat and areas that people can get out into nature. But so I think the people who are most removed from nature are critical for us to touch on. All those audiences are obviously important. We're getting many of many kids involved in conservation, literally thousands by by a hatch program we do. It's where we we're literally following turtles in the wild. We have threatened species here in Massachusetts and we collect their eggs. That's why we follow them. And then we hatch them and we put them into classrooms two at a time for the kids to raise through the whole school year. And then in the spring, they do a field trip and release them back into the wild from where they were laid. And it's really a life altering experience uh, where they are helping to recover a threatened species personally. They give them names, they, they do the whole thing, but they help change the world while acquiring some STEM skills as well. But um, I think going back to your first question, which was, Quick oh, just, just the talented team around oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you show off who they are and, and what are some of the things they're working on and where would you yeah. like your, your teammates to go? Uh, well, so this we, isn't we about do, you, it's about your teammates. We, we do have a great team and, and uh, people that are doing genomics work and One Health work. You know, One Health is the bringing together of human medicine, veterinary medicine, and environmental health 
uh, ecosystem health. We just got an international award um, from a, an outfit in Switzerland for our project in Madagascar, uh, where we're bringing the community and the wild together to implement their, their needs in a way that will create long-term sustainability and preservation of the rainforest and its inhabitants. And so benefiting both of them to the, to the betterment of all of them. Um, and, and I'm so proud of that award because it's, it's one that uh, came on a pretty young project. We, we'd only been there for about a year. Uh, but so we have incredible scientific minds. We have incredible, uh, both in vet veterinary sciences, in genetics, in genomics, and some of that is going to help us in the long term to pre prevent extinction. Uh, but also we have great minds in education and they're developing new ways of partnering with the community, with, particularly with the inner city community, to bring our skills and our mission in ways that are very important to their life. So we're bringing them in to do be co-designers of programs. And we've got incredible minds at animal welfare that are coming up with new ways to assess it, new ways to improve it. Uh, frankly, I, you know, our animals probably have a better level of welfare than most people you know. <laughs> um, so, but, but that's not by accident, that's by, by design. Um, just building creative new exhibits that don't rely on uh, tried and true methods, but actually push the envelope in new directions. You know, one of the keys to keeping the zoo uh, pertinent and relevant in people's lives is to keep it dynamic. And so it's gonna be ever changing. It's gonna be ever improving. And uh, that's something that our, our team is really conscious of. If there, if there were some areas that I'd, I'd love us to work on, it's, it's in uh, really uh, being a little less risk averse. Um, I think that uh, I'm sort of a risk taker and some people counterbalance me, but you know, I won't be here forever. And I have to make sure that I leave behind a team that's super innovative and um, not taking the safe road, but but pushing the envelope in, in the directions we've been doing. And I'm so proud of that gorilla exhibit, but um, you know, we've got to continue to push that envelope and the, the way we uh, design for animals and, and people. And, and uh, so the way we conduct programs, I, I, I love that co-design program. And that is something that, uh, we're we're at the forefront of we're actually involved in a pilot project with Antioch and with uh, two other zoos, one in the Midwest and and in Seattle. And the three of us are are doing this as a pilot to teach other zoos how to uh, pull off co-design successfully. With the I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna follow up on that. Just if you had a wish list without kind of tipping your your hand, um, are there strategic partners, whether it be corporations, foundations? zoos or do you have like if you had a wish list of, of uh you know three five year plan like what would that I, that strategic partner look like i think uh in a broad sense we're looking at it depends upon what component of the zoo operation we're talking about in particular we've had some focus on the life sciences community of late um and to get them involved with the zoo because i think ultimately there are some great conservation opportunities there and, and some are doing it uh but you know for example national grid and a tried and true utility is in here sponsoring boston lights um yeah. but but i think uh as we look at the future you know different different partners from the life sciences community is are are ones that we're particularly interested in in partnering with so are you going to announce it's uh called the moderna zoo now or no <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we can do that for the right gift. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that. I, I would expect that they may have some cash hanging around. <laughs> oh, the stock price today it looks like they do. Yeah, that's like look pretty pretty impressive. Yeah, we, um, we, John, we can sorry. give them more value for it. <laughs> no, I, I mean that's uh you know I mean it's not the NFL or the the um, NBA, but you do see now that they're trying to pull out extra revenue by the logos on the shirts and wherever they can put stuff yeah. to generate some yeah. alpha seems to be where it's going. And I think I, I appreciate that cre creativity too, because they're, 
every inch of real estate that they're able to assemble, they're, right. they're pulling dollars out and, of it. And why not uh, have a partnership like that? You know, in reality, you know, we do have to look at the partners and make sure that that our 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 mission and our ethics are aligned. But um, but I think ultimately, um, you know, we are relatively new into the whole sort of sponsorship arena. But uh, it's it's working for us and getting better. And and uh, as I was saying to you earlier, we've got another big company that's rented the entire zoo facility this afternoon and this evening. And and uh, they for the second year in a row, they liked it so much. And uh, so we we are making more friends, building more uh, more partners as we as we go. But we have an awful lot of untapped potential. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, John, I, I'll, I'll go ahead again, if that's okay. Um, tell me about the Festival of Lights and how that came into existence and what, what actually it does for you and like either foot traffic or just exposure. Yeah, no, it, 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 technically it's called Boston Lights, a lantern experience. That's all right. But it is a festival of lights. And in fact, we didn't name it festival because when we first launched it, uh, this is the third year of it, but when we were first launching it, uh, the mayor had declared that there shall be no festivals in the city. So we quickly changed the name. <laughs> um, but um, it was something that it's really interesting because we were working on it. One of the other zoos in the Midwest was doing it and having some success. And so we, we brought them in and we talked to them and decided we wanted to go down that path. It has a lot of different purposes. One, it drives gate attendance. But more importantly, it, in many ways, it takes the same resource, our real estate, which is so valuable, this big hunk of land in the middle of the city, that's all uh, fenced off by nature of having to protect our animals and keep them in. And uh, it's something we can use for more hours a day by doing something in the evening like this. So um, we were all set to do it and then COVID hit and uh, we had to have some long, hard conversations about whether to go forth with it because, um, you know, we didn't know if all of our investment would be lost if COVID got worse or if, uh, for example, they, they came down with another uh, uh, mandate that you couldn't go out to any of these venues or people just wouldn't come out. So we had a long, hard discussion about it, but I, I saw it as one of the unique opportunities that was hiding in the... Um, in the environment of COVID that we could benefit by. It could accelerate our growth and it has, and it's been really successful. Our board of directors signed on, somewhat, some of them somewhat grudgingly. They were <laughs> nervous about losing a lot of money on it, but it has been an absolute home run. And it's been something that's been so well received by our community, particularly the surrounding community in the depths of COVID. They were so thrilled to come out to a safe place with their family and, and have a wonderful time. And so now we're in the third year. Last year, without some of the COVID restrictions in place, we got over 200,000 people. Uh, this year, we're shooting even higher. And uh, it's, it's introducing people to the zoo for the first time. Some people who might think, oh, I don't really go for zoos. And, and a lot of people have a dated view of zoos, you know, and don't, don't understand that it's not a lot of animals in little cages anymore but it's uh you know we really are a conservation organization and and that the animals are incredibly well treated and cared for and and don't come out of the wild but um so it brought us those new audiences and they've kept coming and once we once we broke that barrier of their coming here once so we'll be doing other creative evening programs and and we're we're doing more and more with the sort of corporate outings and the birthday parties, all those things. So we're, we're uh, really trying to diversify our revenue streams, you know, for stability purposes and uh, grow them. And, and it's been uh, a really exciting time for the zoo. And, and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, COVID brought many challenges, but it also brought our opportunities. And, and we, we went to staff for creative ideas of things we could do during COVID. And they came back with over 200 ideas, which we vetted and we some we tried and we're still doing some of them. We're doing uh, online education called Zoo to You uh, on Facebook Live still once a week uh, from each zoo uh, because it's been so popular and so well received. 
we were doing it daily during COVID when we were closed just to keep people engaged. But, you know, so many creative ideas. And, and so, you know, I guess that's one thing that I would always say, and I, I think a lot of the zoo staff has is, is in every crisis, there are hidden opportunities and you just have to keep your head up and keep your eyes open and keep your brain working and, and figure out where are the opportunities that are lying in here. And uh, that's what we did and, and we've really benefited by it. Um, my last question for you, John, is um, the, uh, are there any, um, like, Anything on, in the horizon you'd like to see happen at the zoo that's not happening now, like any dreams or vision and, and maybe some things you learned from uh, coming out of COVID? I would say I, I wanna keep our capital program really moving. We have some big challenging projects to get done that are gonna help us do more in the arena of genomics. You know, right now we're working, all of our genomics work is taking place over at the Broad and in collaboration with them. But uh, we want to have that on grounds. We want to have people learning about it. We want to have um, them really learning. We, we launched a conservation society where people can actually go out and do con field conservation here in Eastern Massachusetts with our team and get their hands dirty saving species. So I'd really like to see that grow. We, we have uh, other sort of uh, practical things like we're trying to get a license plate for the zoo off the ground. But I think ultimately what I, what I would love to see- Oh, is, like, like how you can have a teacher or the Cape or Red Sox do- Or the whale, the whale license plate, you know, yeah. you see the whale yeah. conservation yeah. license plate. I said the gorilla on it. Yeah. Do yeah. other states have that? Other states? Yeah, I don't- like, like, I, I, I don't, I think I've seen some other states, but Massachusetts is very friendly to it. So we've got yeah, that, I think we've got do, it yeah. through yeah. a lot of the ringers already. We just got to sell some more license plates and get them on the street. Uh, Sign um, me up. I'm, uh, put me on the way. So I'll, be, I'll, right. I'll put it on my, my EV, my new, my new electric car. Um, we're about to wrap up, but there's one section that I sometimes miss, but I, I kind of have fun with it. And you already gave us one, which is when Joe took the little vacation outside his home. Um, but this section's called Plead the Fifth. Are there any funny stories without naming names that uh, that uh, you could share with us around the zoo? I could. Uh, I, I have more stories than you can possibly imagine, but I usually, because there's so many, I need a little uh, prompt for funny stories. Um, um, there's some that I want to plead the fifth and <laughs> not share. Um, uh, What's a funny one lately? Um, uh, well, I, 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 there was a time, it's kind of funny, but I had to get by a lion and close a door to prevent his escape. And I, he and I had to be face to face. And uh, that, was, that was many years ago. So, so the statute of limitations has run out on it. <laughs> But he and I just locked eyes and I had to slide by him. I was within four feet of him and we just were staring into each other's eyes. And he was so dumbfounded by my incredible stupidity to do that, that he didn't know what to do. And I got the door shut. But, um, you know, there, there are incredibly funny stories almost every day. The place is like a soap opera because when you have living animals, and you hear some of the stories. The other day we had a, uh, I don't know if you know what a ringtail is. It's like a relative of raccoons from Central South America. And uh, we had one get out of its holding space. It was still within a building, but it had hidden within a, a, a cabinet. And when the person opened the door, there he was face to face <laughs> with the ringtail and it jumped over his shoulder <laughs> and they had to capture it That's and get great. it back in. Yeah. Well, uh, for all our viewers, I highly encourage you to check it out. I mean, there's so many. Uh, I went when I was little, um, but it does change. It's kind of, I look at it like a living, breathing process. It, it's not stagnant in any way. Sometimes people think when they go to a zoo, it's one and done and it doesn't change. But with under John's leadership, it's always evolving. It's a living, breathing process, which is quite, quite phenomenal. Yeah, it, with that it's said, a, no I, question. Wait, when you John, have live um, animals. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. 
Well, listen, we want to thank you for your time. I just, again, remind all our listeners to hit that subscription button. The like button would be amazing for your followership. John, we'd like to both thank you for coming on today. I know we, we spent some time personally recently, which was, was amazing. Um, but thanks for all the great work that you do. And we both wish you continued success in your endeavors. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the invitation to be on with you guys. And thank you for all your help and support. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp.